I am very happy indeed to welcome George and Dana to give a talk on um, on misinformation down the garden path, online misinformation and not changing views. Um, George is the director of the Melbourne um, um, Melbourne University I School, and has been studying information, how people interact with it, and we've been doing misinformation for twenty five years. I believe. And Dave is no flat driver, he's been studying how people interact with information, misinformation, and so on for a considerable period of time. So, without further ado, I delay things a lot. I'm going to just stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're going to run you through a series of studies that we've done today that broadly center around how people form, change their views when they interact with information online. Um, so we'll give you a little bit about us, why we're talking to you about this, because, you know, you're the people who do people. Um, and we'll give you a little bit of overview about the way we'd like to run the talk. I might get someone to keep an eye on the chat and Zoom, please, just because um, we do like to do a bit of an, an interactive talk. A little bit about why we should care about online information. Um, doesn't congeniality bias ruin pretty much everything? Well, no, hopefully not. Um, a study we did about online information and view change and a little follow-up we did to investigate the issue of homophily. Then I'll hand over to George to talk about misinformation, technology and people working together and give a bit of a wrap up. So right now I'm an interact, I'm a senior lecturer in innovative interactive technologies at RMIT University. Basically I do people and computers. Before that I was here. Um, I did 10 years working in a library, trying to make stuff easier to use. And I did my PhD here at the University of Melbourne. I have got a bunch of grants, had a bunch of fun, worked for Nokia for a while. That was cool too. Uh, and I'm in the process of moving down the road to RMIT as well. Um, but here I've been at Knife School. Previously, I've been a whole host of different universities doing this sort of stuff. And for 10 years, I ran a business working on software for the desktop publishing industry. So we're here today uh, hopefully so you can get to know us a little bit and also so we can get to know you a little bit and we recognize that we may have different paradigms we might be a little bit like cats and dogs um, which is why we want this talk to be way more of a dialogue than us like talking at you so if you have questions you want to interrupt during the talk please do so um, we love to run our talks interactively the other thing is I did want to warn you that we will be touching on some subjects today that might be a little bit uncomfortable so feel free to step out take a break whatever if you need to um, just because the nature of view change kind of means that sometimes we'll be talking about stuff that's a bit weird or gross or horrible um so Online information, well, why should we care about online information if we care about the real world? It seems a bit of a tenuous link until you put the human in the picture. Online information affects people's heads. Their behavior then goes on to affect the real world. And this shows up in things like how they vote. Misinformation can affect how people vote. You know, you, my dad told me that the Prime Minister of New Zealand's partner was in theory on home detention wearing an ankle bracelet and therefore he wasn't going to vote for her and I'm like well you were never voting for her anyway dad but you know this is <laughs> this is the kind of thing that happens it literally happens um COVID misinformation there was massive anti-vaccination campaigns on Facebook I watched one of them unfold because you know everyone has that one Facebook friend and you don't unfriend them because it's so fascinating but kind of like a train wreck at the same time um, and even the breeding of extremism, right? The Christchurch attacks in New Zealand um, were partly blamed on, whether it's true or not, algorithms encouraging people to engage with more and more extreme news and information. So online information goes through people to affect the real world. Um, in and of itself, you know, someone could put up misinformation saying the moon is purple, and if nobody did anything about it, it kind of wouldn't matter, right? Like, so the moon is purple, so what? Um, but if then people start, I don't know, believing the earth is also flat and then believing that all of science is wrong, well, then the moon is purple becomes a problem. So it's online information has to go through people to affect the real world. So turning to the first of our studies, 
one of the things that we've heard a lot about is filter bubbles. Now, filter bubbles, look, they've basically been disproven at this point. Filter bubbles aren't a real thing. Um, but we do know that people maybe tend to be more interested in information that agrees with their views or tend to avoid information that may not agree with their views. So one of the studies we're going to talk about today is a little study I ran with an honours student about what people do when they actually run into misinformation online. And one of the things that we didn't say at the beginning of the talk is we're qualitative researchers, which I know is like probably a bit of a foreign landscape to some of you in the room. But we do things like get people to tell us about things in great detail and then analyze that as data. So it might be a little bit different than the things you've heard about in the past. So feel free to ask us about that. But yeah. So why did we why did we do this study? Well, again, you know, we keep hearing about how people just disengage from information they disagree with or just shout it down or or you know, generally will not look at it or read it. And I had run a study that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute that showed that at least for some people that wasn't true, that they were actively engaging with information they disagreed with on a regular basis and changing their minds if they felt they were wrong. And I'm like, well, so the dominant narrative isn't the only narrative. What's actually going on here? So what do people really do when they're confronted with information they don't agree with? Now, this is something that's very hard to set up in a lab, right? You someone in front of a computer and have them swiping through information and then flash up. Nazis are cool. And, you know, you would get a reaction, sure. But would it be what they would actually do out there in the real world if they were confronted with that information? So what we did is we ran a one-week diary study with 10 people in September 2020. Now, that date is important because all of those people were in Melbourne. So they were really bored and trapped online, basically, for... So I'm considering redoing the study because I think the timing and the location seriously biased our results. But just putting that in context. So we ran a diary study. Every day they were sent a little online diary and asked to tell us about the experiences that they had when they ran into something online that they disagreed with. How did they find it? What did they do after they find it? How did it make them feel? Did they do anything in particular? Did they just walk away? At the end of the one week, we interviewed each of those people just to check anything in the diary that we wanted to get more detail about, did it make sense, um, to ask them for more context about what they were doing when they found the information. They sent us screenshots and stuff in their diaries as well. So then we put for each participant the whole thing into a single narrative and analysed it using a technique called thematic analysis. It's a really common technique for analysing qualitative data. So... How did they find the data? Well, lots of them found it while they were just scrolling, right? So again, the filter bubble isn't real. People just scrolling through their algorithms found plenty of stuff that they disagreed with. Um, scrolling through uh, uh, social media feeds while they were taking a break or before I go to sleep. Some of them reported deliberately seeking out information they didn't agree with, right? They they went looking for information they knew they were likely to agree with. Um, not search, but seeking out, where they would go to the Reddit thread, the slash r slash Melbourne Reddit thread. And remember, it was Melbourne during lockdown. Everyone was angry, right? We were all annoyed. We were all done. Um so, you know, they went there knowing they were likely to see a range of views about lockdown, some of which they would disagree with. And some people deliberately went looking for controversy, right? So it was like, I looked at the posts that were most upvoted or downvoted because I knew that when I looked at those, they were going to be interesting. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of running into it accidentally, but also deliberately looking for views out there than their own. So how did they respond? Well, lots of them kind of disengaged or walked away, scrolled past. One person reported unfriending some people after they posted their views on vaccination on Facebook. He was like, can't be associated with that anti-science type stuff. Um, lots of people reported reading the comments. Like, okay, so here's this thing I disagree with. What are other people saying about this thing I disagree with? Some people looked for more information because they didn't know what something was. Or um, when someone saw 
uh, and your president, President Modi being compared to Trump, he was like, well, I don't, I don't know about this and I don't know why this comparison would be made. So they did a search um, looking at the Swedish response to COVID because they were like, is this what I'm seeing, misinformation or is it correct? Um, upvoting or downvoting what they saw, um, clicking dislike to show people that I disagree with them or to show a commenter, hey, this comment is really useful and you could comment more. Some people reported commenting, but it was less common than upvoting or downvoting because upvoting and downvoting is easy, right? Like you can just click. And for a lot of sites, you don't even have to have a login to do that click. Whereas the minute you want to do a comment, you have to log in. Um, and, you know, when they were posting, it was to debunk opinions. Um, sometimes they posted in places that weren't disagreeing with something directly. So someone was like, I found this thing that was really anti-China and I didn't want to get into a fight with that guy, but I posted something that was, you know, giving an alternative view on my own Facebook feed just to make sure that those alternative views were out there in the world. Um, some people reported very deliberately not sharing their views um because they were like i don't want to get into a fight or i'm a very passive consumer those were the kind of two i don't want to fight i don't really post anything online anyway and finally and most rarely some people reported changing their views as a result of things they found online sometimes this was kind of personal stuff like ah oh, I wasn't really thinking about needing to get a job at the end of my degree, but now after my friend posted about what they're doing to get a job, even though they're a year out, I've thought about it. And um, it's it's actually more important to be doing this now than I think. But one person reported changing views on, for example, the, um, the, the big tech payments to news media. She was initially very opposed to this. And once she looked into it as a result of something she saw on Facebook, she was actually like, no, technology companies should be paying for, for news media. So, you know, some of the things were more personal. Some of the things were um, more political. So why did they engage? If they didn't just kind of go, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't need to see that. Why did they engage? Well, some of it was this controversy seeking behavior. One of the, one of the participants was like, I knew the comments and that would be spicy. So I wanted to have a look. And again, we should we should remember the context. Everyone was in lockdown. We were all super bored. Maybe we wouldn't go looking for the spicy comments now. Maybe we would. Um, people reported wanting to see a spectrum of views, get a sense of like what Australia's opinion was. Some people wanted to compare their opinion to other people. I wanted to know where I sit compared to other people. This was particularly common when reading the comments, right? Because they were trying to get that range and going, am I the most extreme? Am I the least extreme? Where do I fit? Um, other people wanted just to be validated. They wanted to see someone saying what they thought. So they would keep looking for that congeniality bias, basically. They were like, yeah, I don't agree with that, but surely someone said the right sensible thing and argued with this thing that is clearly wrong. Some people read stuff to construct a counter argument, right? They were like, okay, I'm going to read that so that the next time one of my weird anti vaccine Facebook friends says something stupid to me, I can just snap right back with something sensible. And some people reported reading, and this, this happened in the view change study as well, reported reading because they wanted to build empathy with the other position. They were like, well, they are people. Their views must come from somewhere. So maybe I need to be thinking a little bit more about where their views might come from. So what were their motivations to react, upvote, downvote, walk away, do various things? Relationships were a key mediator of this. So one person used a like to try to rekindle a friendship that, you know, they kind of lost touch with someone and they were like, oh, I hope that, and it was a, it was a platonic relation. I, I hope that he would see that I would had liked it and would, would reach out. Um, some people would keep quiet to protect a relationship. I can't be getting into that because it will just end in things being horrible. Um, some people kept quiet because it was like, oh, it's just strangers on the internet. They're not worth influencing. So when something had a strong impact, that 
was a motivation to react if something was not so serious or not so impactful people wouldn't react so someone was like I saw the stupid thing on chihuahuas that I disagreed with and I just scrolled past because it was chihuahuas someone else was was more like well you know this is this is really serious and it's wrong and I feel I need to like protect my family so I'm going to jump in and and say something here um so sometimes they reacted because they came across a comment thread where their views or their perspective was not reflected so what the hell people were agreeing with it and I was like well someone has to say this so they they reacted because their views weren't being reflected and they needed to see them reflected in the conversation then there's kind of trying to persuade other people well maybe I can make a difference by by reacting maybe even if I can't change that person's mind I'll be able to change the minds of the lurkers and actually there's good research in our field to show that yes you can change the minds of the lurkers even if you don't change the mind of the poster then there's the issue of presentation of self so this was a motivation to post but also a motivation not to post right um so there's this whole thing of I don't want my internet persona to have all of these traces of me so I'm not going to be posting that but also I'm unfriending this person because I don't want to be associated with that garbage over there so this these were you know presentation of self on the internet people see this as a real reflection of themselves um then there was attention management so not drawing attention to oneself but also not drawing attention to a view. If I upvote or downvote, then it becomes the most upvoted comment and then other people read it. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna engage with that because they don't deserve the clicks. And finally, there was interface design. Boring, bog standard computer science-based interface design. I couldn't be bothered signing up for an account, so I didn't do anything about it, even though it was terrible. So this is the point at which the kind of technology piece starts to come into it and show the influence that, you know, the way we set these technologies up has an impact. So what are the key takeaways from this study? There is a lot more engagement with ideas that people don't like than we might think. Sometimes those ideas are served up. Sometimes people go looking for them. Um, whether they engaged or not was related both to the technology but also to their own sense of self and their values and the things that were important to them um and it did give people an opportunity to at least look at other views and sometimes even change their views now i might just quickly pause there in case anyone's got any questions at the stage yep yeah, really, really, i just want to make sure you say something about how you found the people and i know and i can I know it can, um, you know, it's um, it's not going to be widely representative, but no, we and it's have some sense about how representative there might be or how much variability there was between people in terms of things. so. It was a mix of uh, self, we asked people to self-identify their gender, a mix of self-identified men and women. Nobody reported being non-binary. Um, they were identified through the student researchers' personal networks, through me posting on my social media and snowball sampling as well. So one person might say to us, you know, um, we had a variety of linguistic backgrounds and cultures. We had age range was from about 22 to 30, which isn't great. Um, but, you know, getting anyone to do anything during lockdown, we were lucky to get the 10 participants we got. So that is certainly something to consider. Um, like I said, I've put the big caveat about when the study was run to, because I think it hugely affects the results. And I'm hoping to rerun it with a psychology honors student at RMIT this year, because I think the results would be quite different. Um, but it gives us some insight into at least what one group of people do when they run into online information that they don't agree with and it's you know it's at least different to the narrative that we get about it if i could just follow up on that i i, I understand all those caveats i think that's that's um it's all really interesting you're a very smart academic i'm assuming your friends are probably more like they're not going to be smart academics how many of these people were academics or in some sort of professional uh so most of them were academics or professionals, but they weren't my friends. They were the students' friends. So way less people at university than we would anticipate if it was um, 
like me doing the recruiting because it would be all academics if it was me doing the recruiting or just about all academics. Um, so yeah, some still studying, some out in the world doing various kinds of professional roles. Um, and the things they disagreed with were, were way more varied than the examples I've given here to anti-China, anti-COVID. It was like body shaming. It was like guys being horrible on Grindr and promoting certain views of what a gay man should look like on Grindr. Um, it was uh food things you know it was it was less important stuff as well as more important stuff there was one person who was like yeah I didn't find anything I disagreed with all week because I'm not a drama queen and he it was it was a guy so it was, <laughs> it was like okay uh sure yep cool uh you're having a better lockdown than pretty much everyone else in Melbourne so you go with your bad self <laughs> But yeah, so that's that's the kind of breakdown of, of who we saw. And you're right, it would be interesting to run this with a professional recruitment company to get a bigger diversity of experiences. Thank you. Oh, carry on, sorry. So uh, with regard to the um, impact, you know, um, the motivation to react on, on not to react, there was a one cost was uh, impact, right? Yep. So, was there any difference whether the impact was on directly related, you know, on his or her life, you know, or the impact is on general society? Was there any difference? It tended to be things that they felt strongly about. And so, just sort of separating that out, you know, does someone way over there not getting vaccinated or you know necessarily affect me personally no but if I feel very strongly about vaccination you know does some guy on Grinder who has really toxic views about what men should look like necessarily affect me personally well I wouldn't date someone with toxic views anyway but I don't think people should be spreading toxic views on the internet so it's that kind of it affected them it tended to be things that affected them personally because it was things they cared strongly about rather than um, the kind of, I know there was a lot of stuff during COVID about, about, hey, if you don't get vaccinated, it means I can't leave the house. And it wasn't that sort of thing quite so much as, yeah, things that they held as deep principles. Right, we good? Nothing on Zoom? <laughs> okay, so let's look a little bit about online information and view change. And this is a really old study. This was done in 2019. We were the luckiest, the other guys, Stephen Macri and I, who did the study, we were the luckiest people alive. We came up with the study and then the world went to hell in a handbasket and we'd done the right study at the right time. Having said that, the journal that we have been working with has held on to the paper at this point for bordering on two and a half years. So it hasn't had quite the impact we could have hoped for. But it's... Understanding the way online information affects view change is super, super important because things like vaccination um, perspectives changed over time. And a lot of that, given that, you know, we couldn't leave the house, was due to the information we were running into online. Um, so it's it's really important to understand how people change their views and help support productive view change. Now, Productive view change shouldn't be what we, the elite, want. It should be reflective and informed rather than believe what I believe, right? I, I'm not okay with taking a believe what I believe approach. So what's the gap in this? I mean, you all are psychologists, so you've studied attitudinal change quite a bit, but there's all this kind of stuff about fake news, bias, filter bubbles, everyone getting their news via social media, search manipulation, um, question asking, echo chambers. But there's people in the middle of this. And one of the things we haven't looked at is the connection between the people and all of this technological stuff and how it actually affects how they change their views. What does all this online information do to an individual person? How do they interact with it if they're changing their mind about something? So there's another way of kind of framing this gap in terms of the literature. There's a lot of um, propaganda 
literature from like the 1950s looking at how to influence people to believe the same thing. So we've got a lot of stuff about, you know, um, consistent messaging, pervasive consistent messaging will get people to believe what you want. Well, the internet exists, so that that chicken has very much flown the coop. There's a lot of stuff in design about how to encourage people to maybe believe uh, computer science design and about how to maybe c encourage people to believe something or behave in a certain way. Um, there's stuff in journalism about how emotional journalism is more likely to change people's views. Um, if you actually report, you know, how people were feeling about something. Um, politics. Uh, Natalie Helberger is a political scientist who's written about how uh, essentially search engines and social media should be forced to show people a diversity of viewpoints because that's good for democracy. And then, of course, psychology. And I'm not going to get into that because I am seriously outclassed in that space in this room. But, you know, we're coming to it from an inter information interaction perspective. Of what about people in online information? So how did we study this one? We did 18 interviews that we recruited from a variety of sources, uh, Reddit forum slash r slash change my view, uh, Mumsnet. The Guardian and the BBC had run some series on things that changed people's mind and we were able to recruit some of them. Uh, university mailing lists. So we recruited them from a variety of sources and not everyone was uh, an academic. Um, there were lots of people who were out there doing the professional thing. They were all in London or the UK. We did, I think, two Zoom interviews and the rest were, it wasn't Zoom back then, it was Skype actually, because it was pre-Zoom days. Um, but we asked them to choose a topic that they wanted to talk about. Um, we did ask them to not talk to us about anything illegal or anything that they would find distressing because, you know, we wanted to at least try not to make people cry. We did actually have someone cry in one of the interviews because they were so upset about climate change. Um, and we asked them questions about the information, how they found it, what they were doing, how it affected them, what happened next. Now, this was a little bit of an ethically complicated study, right? Um, because we needed to swerve some of those more complicated topics, the topics we're that were going to upset people, things that were possibly illegal. Um, we couldn't shame them. We had to be very careful with how we interviewed because we couldn't be rude or disruptive about either their pre-view change view or their post-view change view. It's not cool to shame your interview participants. Um, so we took a, a really empathy first type approach where we're like, we just accepted their position, whatever it might be at whatever point in the process. And of course, there was a researcher well-being component to this as well. You know, we interviewed people about some pretty complicated stuff, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And so, you know, we did a debrief with our participants at the end, but we also did a debrief. We did a team interview. There was two of us. Um, we did a debrief with each other after the participants left too, going, okay, are we okay? Everyone okay? Everyone kind of coping okay with the subject matter? Because they talked to us about a bunch of different stuff, including climate change, um, gay rights, whether Michael Jackson is in fact a pedophile, um, crime statistics. They talked to us about personal health decisions. They talked to us about their voting decisions. They talked to us about the decisions they'd made about their education. And we even got one flat earth conspiracy theorist in the wild. So, you know, we got people to talk to us about a range of different topics here and how they came to, to believe the things that they believed. So what information did they use? Well, they used social media was one of the places where they tended to first have that interaction. Video was quite impactful. They searched, but not generally speaking as a first point of call that tended to happen a bit later um news media and social media forums were quite important conversations with friends were one of the touch points that happened along the way one person talked to us about a video game that had changed their view it was something put out by peta where you had to save the chicken from the saw and they were like i just couldn't eat meat after that i was like okay okay cool um People talked about looking for actual raw data. So one of the ones that talked about raw data was a guy who was like, well, how 
bad as the knife crime thing anyway? Is it is it actually a thing or is it a moral panic that's happening in the UK? And he tried to find, you know, Office of National Statistics statistics to show whether crimes with knives were actually increasing. Um, the flat earther had also decided the moon landing didn't happen and had gone to look for the schematics of the spacesuit helmet because it looked like the spacesuit turned its head and he was like, I don't think it can do that. So, you know, really detailed data seeking. Um, and then there were the sheep. We'll talk about the sheep. Okay, so I just follow up on that. When he found the sheep, when he found the schematics, um, because I've seen the spaceships, and they really do turn their heads, and it's really obvious that he's trying to say, if you're all about the information, did he take that information and go, oh, I'm wrong? They could turn their heads. Maybe I should rethink this. I think he decided that um, they couldn't turn their heads based on his understanding of the schematics. <laughs> <laughs> so the sheep thing was a woman who went vegetarian. Uh, she went for a nice sheep dinner at a sheep farm. And this was the end point of her view change process. We'll talk talk through it a little bit more in a moment. But the end point, the point where she was like, nah, I just can't anymore. She and her boyfriend went out to a really nice sheep farm where part of the experience was you have a lamb dinner. And they were sitting there having their lamb dinner and one of the sheep kind of barred. And her boyfriend looked at her and said, oh, he's missing his mummy. And she was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> So this view change is uh, referred to among the team as Sheepgate. So yes, Sheepgate, the, the sheep were the stony end for this particular person. So what unexpected behaviors did we see? Well, one of the big unexpected behaviors was overload and disengagement. Now, we would expect this if we weren't interviewing people about view change, but we were interviewing people about view change and they still reported going, actually, no, I just, I can't, I can't anymore. And then maybe come, coming back to it later. We saw way more fact checking than we would have expected, right? Because everyone says nobody fact checks online. Admittedly, you know, you're going to get some reporting bias these people are telling you, but they were able to provide us with an enormous amount of detail about what they'd done and where they'd gone. So there was a person who had decided to have surgery on her toe after deciding not to have surgery on her toe. And she'd like watch videos of the surgery. She'd gone on a runner's forum and asked a whole bunch of people about their recovery time. She had looked at different surgeons all over the EU and was like, reviewing rating scores so there was a lot of detailed information seeking going on here um one of our participants talked to us about changing universities after she'd put down a hefty deposit because she saw this weird video from her first choice about mature students she was like oh maybe there aren't that many mature students there so she went to the university websites and downloaded population statistics to see how many mature students there were at, at each university and we saw lots of people deliberately filter bubble bursting, engaging either regularly or intermittently with information that they disagreed with. You know, some of them did it as a matter of course. There was a woman who was like, I am super left wing and here is my print copy of The Economist to which I subscribe because I want to see what they're up to. So there was a lot of this kind of deliberate engagement with things that they didn't agree with going on. So how does it all fit together? Well, you'll be pleased to know that we took your ABC model of view change and added information to it. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is stuff that you will recognize, but we'll point at the information and stuff. So there's active seeking or passive encountering. It's the bit that creates awareness of the possibility for change. So they have their original view and they have an informational foundation for that. Then they'll have a little trigger that kind of gets them started, maybe feeling some of that cognitive dissonance, feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Then they'll get a really strong trigger, usually something else, the catalyst, which will push them over the tipping point. Then they'll go for look, looking for information that reinforces or supports their changed view. So right, I'm going to be vegetarian. I'm going to go on the BBC website, food website, and look for recipes so that I can cook something that my boyfriend will eat because he is not vegetarian. Um, and then they kind of move forward with their change view. Sometimes they shared it with other people, sometimes they didn't. So that was kind of their thing. So informational touch points. Let's talk through, sorry, the Michael Jackson one, because it's a really nice example of this. Um, 
this guy's original view was no nah, Michael Jackson didn't do it I'm a fan I love listening to his music and then he started hearing about the 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 documentary that was on Netflix where those people those young men reported what had happened to them and he started hearing about it and he thought well maybe I need to watch the documentary so that's his kind of sort of initial trigger comes from a base of fandom starts hearing about the documentary on his social media watches the video and goes oh whoa like why would they say these things happened if they didn't happen they have nothing to gain from this then started looking around for the Jackson family's um kind of response to it and saw some stuff that he said was clearly misinformation and clearly awful so that was kind of the tipping point he was like nah clearly this just I I have been wrong about it I ignored it because I was a fan I've tipped over into believing that Michael Jackson was a criminal. Then he talked to some people at work and they were like, yeah, yeah, it was a really impactful documentary and we changed our views as well. So he had that reinforcement and went away with his changed view. Um, the woman with the toe, she was told by a doctor that she should avoid surgery until the last possible moment. She had a helix rigid in her toe and it was really, really affecting her life. And she couldn't exercise and the doctor had also said, and don't gain any weight. Thanks, doctor. So then she started hanging out. She's a marathoner. She started hanging out on some runners forums. And lots of the people there had had the surgery. So she's like, okay. So then she actually did a search to look for information about the surgery. It was like, well, maybe this isn't as terrible as the doctor has has told me. Um, went through a bunch of recovery, like people write recovery diaries, these, these online health communities, and went, okay, yep. Then she worked out how she could get this done without telling basically anyone in her life because her family is part of her original informational foundation. They're like, you don't take a day off work unless you're dead and then you take one day and then you get back to work. So she, she had to figure out how she could do it without any support for her recovery or without telling anyone. And that was where the surgeons overseas came in. I'm going on holiday to Switzerland to have my toe fixed. Um, and then she she was moving forward with the plan, and I kind of hope she was able to get it done before the whole COVID thing hit, because this was July 2019. Um, and I've often wondered, you know, how long it took her to, to, to carry out the toe plan. Um, so again, you are well aware of this, but the key thing is that most people happened on something by just, just passive encounters, scrolling through social media, um, the Sheepgate thing, her, her view change started, she was scrolling through social media and one of her friends posted a documentary about um, how in some countries sheep are kept as pets. And she was like, that is weird that we treat cats and dogs differently. But she came from an Eastern European country and she was like, if there's not, a, if there's not meat and it's not a meal. So she's coming from this and she's like, well, that started me thinking. Um, then she had the lamb meal. And then she started doing some information thinking about, okay, well, how do I keep my iron up and how do I feed my boyfriend food that actually tastes good? And then after she changed, she started debunking misinformation about vegetarian children on some of her Eastern European friends' uh, Facebook feeds. So, you know, once we get post that, there's also information activities. So the key findings for this is that serendipity is really important in these online information mediated view change. But people are way, way, way more savvy about it than we're giving them credit for. And the ecosystem around a change is complicated, right? Because it involves these, these social media encounters, it involves video, it involves search, it involves talking to friends about how do we keep our iron up? We talked to another vegetarian woman who a big part of her process was finding her friend who was a pharmacist and being like, okay, so iron and vegetarianism. And all the strands of feelings, behavior, thought, all have to come into um, making this view change. I'll stop shortly, but I just want to talk a little bit about a follow-up study that we just ran, which is uh, we did the same study but we used a recruitment company so the people were from all different walks of life we talked to technology teachers we talked to police officers we talked to 
unemployed stay-at-home carers. We talked to people who were sort of just finishing their degrees. But the thing that we asked the recruitment company to find us was people whose views were very different from what they perceived to be their community. So the kind of underlying thing was, well, maybe we'll get some conspiracy theorists, but actually just anyone who doesn't have that social support for their view change, what's going on there? And they talked to us about a bunch of different things. We had two people talk to us about AI, neither of them liked it. We had two or three people talk to us about going vegan, one of whom was a police officer in the north of England. And he was like, yeah, nobody's. We had a guy talk to us who was a a psychiatrist and very well healed talked to us about believing that the monarchy maybe wasn't such a good thing anymore and in his community you shouldn't say anything against the queen or king we had one person talk to us about being pro-brexit and going anti-brexit and one person talked to us about the opposite we had people talk to us about trans rights their views changing in both directions so one person was more pro-trans rights and the other one Recognized that her view was unpopular and possibly not great, but was willing to talk to us about it, right? Which is a brave thing to do. People who talk to us about having been anti-vax and then deciding to get the vaccine and having gotten the vaccine and then deciding it was all a hoax, right? So we got a bunch of different view changes. There were a couple of people who believed some things that I would view as conspiracy theories. So was an interesting set of interviews. We are still working on these, um, but the key findings are that those conversations are just not existent in these kinds of things. With the exception of the police officer who was persuaded by his brother, so his police mates were not part of the vegan community, but his family were basically all vegan. Um, most of them were not talking to people and some of them were really discouraged from talking to people. There was one woman who'd gone plant-based because she felt it was a way to lose weight and she was being really successful and she needed to lose weight, but her hospital dietitian was like, ah, oh, that won't help. So she stopped talking to them about it because they just shut the door basically. But of course, in the absence of being able to talk to people, online information and doing your own research becomes way more important. So these minority viewpoints are space where online information is super, super important and where people are doing their own research. So there's the opportunity for technology to maybe intervene in some pro-social ways. Quickly stop for any questions and then I'll pass over to Jules. Uh, I was just wondering if most of your participants are people who have some sort of like background in education or a higher level of education no not for the second study no we used a recruitment company for that study and so yeah it was a really big range of people because it seems like they have some sort of intelligence or cognitive intelligence that you know maybe more than maybe I, I find a little bit above average intelligent people that they were able to like you know willing or at least willing to change their perspective because maybe people around us are not willing to change their perspective no matter how many reasons you give them well the, 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 there's actually been research done by various people at that tradition there's the, intelligent people are very clever at how they redeploy arguments to defend their position so it they can be much more entrenched in facts than people who are less intelligent they're very complex interactions between so i just people. had hot off the press on a student finish her psychology project down at rmit and she was looking at factors that affect willingness to engage with information that disagrees with you and the only statistically significant finding from the whole thing she was looking at demographics and political leanings the only statistical significant finding from the whole thing was that younger people and left-leaning people perceived themselves as very open-minded but were not in fact more willing to engage with information that disagreed with them than anyone else were they mixed or... no just, just the same <laughs> okay Um, so I'll quickly talk about two studies. Uh, this was one that we, uh, first was the earlier of So what we were actually doing in this case wasn't talking to people, but observing people online and trying to find out what sort of 
reactions people had to misinformation when they came across it on public comment sites. Uh, you know, misinformation come in a number of different forms. People are just parroting misinformation that they don't actually, uh, you know, there isn't, if you will, the original stuff, they're just passing on. In other places, they could be more consciously taking on an identity which uh, isn't actually true. Now, what we were trying to understand is you know, when these things happen, there's a post or an article that is misinformation, what are the responses? But not, not in the sense of people going, oh, I'm happy and sad, but actually, what do they post in reply? And there are some things that we won't observe from that. So people just don't engage and close their ears. We're not going to observe them in this case. We won't see it. But if people sort of speak up against it, uh, and so on, yes, if they post, we'll see that. If they support and applaud it in some way, we'll pick up on that. And if they elaborate the conspiracy theory, say, we'd see that too. But, but which of these is more common and what do people actually do? Uh, so we were trying to look at a variety of different approaches and then sort them into categories and then check if the platforms are essentially the same as a cookie cutter thing and like the different platforms we looked at uh, yeah, YouTube okay. comments. Yeah, okay. We're about to say that. You know, we looked at YouTube comments. We looked at stuff on Twitter or X, as I guess we have to call it now. And we looked at things on newspaper comment sites from the UK. Uh, for this, by the way, we used a mixture of the Daily Mail, which has been known as the Daily Hate, once supported the Nazi party, so quite right-leaning. And then on the other hand, uh, the other one was the Guardian, which is famously sort of more high point, more liberal, etc. Um, but they're, they're both quite interesting ones because their demographics are surprisingly similar in many ways. But, you know, do these things look the same? Or do they look different? Well, but by the way, I can, I, can, I can say if you think they do look different. But um, for a research method, we went out for 10, shall we call them threads, themes, or posts, where there was something false, demonstrably false. Um, it's something to the view of, say, Boris Johnson is a space alien. Yeah, like he might have been an unusual person, but definitely not space. Uh, we took three different uh, topics that we focused on, on three different platforms. So just a reminder, YouTube comments, the newspaper sites, and Twitter. And we looked at uh, COVID. It was that time. Um, we looked at uh, climate change. And we looked at Brexit, which you know, in the UK, fairly contentious topic. Um, and with misinformation on both sides. But how do people react? Well, we actually went, when we were finding the patterns, we find a few things about individual posts, but we also find things about threads as a whole. So let's start with the individual posts. One common response was mockery or laughter. You can't be serious. Or it actually might go, well, everybody knows that and makes some sort of joke about when if George Bush Johnson is a space alien, but don't you know Maggie Thatcher was one too or something like that. And 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 sometimes it was more sarcasm and sometimes it was in favour of the post and sometimes it was against. There were posts that were just, I don't like this, and they would contest it in some form. Those could have a thing of, you're a freaking idiot, or something that was actually... That can't possibly be true, and here's my source information. And the third type of response is that people could actually go, okay, but this is my experience. And they talked about their own lived experience. This is a fairly unusual one, because there were some cases, because I, I did a lot of the coding, I went and found the history of these posters. I was able to identify a few of them. So there was someone who was claiming to be a police officer who was definitely not a police officer. So you know, there are ways in which that may or may not itself true. But these, when you started looking at those three different types of posts, and there are a couple of other ones that are less common, uh, started to find some thread patterns that were actually consistent. One of which is what we call the drive-by. The original poster would come out, say something controversial, and then they drive off. You will never see them again. There could be hundreds, and there were, in one case, literally hundreds of replies, they didn't reply. They, they, they'd had their moment of shouting, driven off. The second one was more like an echo chamber, um, where essentially the views espoused about this misinformation all supported it. 
there wasn't anyone who contested it. So that middle reaction was not found. You might find people who were joking in favour of it. You might go people who were supporting it. But you wouldn't find people who contest it. Even again, sometimes where we had 50 or 60 replies. So it very much created a localised effect of there being one voice. Then there'd be the pylon, where essentially someone would post something that was false, and then everybody comes and dumps on them. The, the negative reactions, it's all, they might be humorous, they might be factual, but they're just going, you complete freaking idiot. And then you'd get that for the next 30, 40 posts. And then finally, there's what we call the ding dong, where it's essentially a cross between the pylon on one side and the uh, echo chamber on the other, where it was like, yes, no, yes, no. But this would go on between usually the original poster and someone who was responding to them. Uh, so there was a change, an exchange of views, but not a change of views very often. Didn't see any changes of views. Or it might be between two posters who were responding to the original post, showing different sides of the argument. Now, one of the things we found from this was that actually these weren't actually very standard cookie cutter responses that were the same on the different platforms. We saw more use of evidence. We saw more discussion on things like the newspaper websites. On the other hand, on Twitter, it was mostly everybody agrees. Um, the use of humour was more often found on YouTube for reasons I don't really understand. Uh, but this wasn't uh, a situation where there were just standard frames and templates that we saw on all of them. Each had their own diversity and particular form of debate. And these did demonstrate that we can see concrete differences in the social reactions in different online forums. They're not the same thing. And that's one of the themes we then took on to our next study, where we're looking at how, talking about that, people disagreeing and providing evidence. Now, if we just look at the evidence used in different communities, what do we see there? And again, we're trying to see that between a number of different communities. Uh, by the way, we all use Reddit. We'll come back onto that at the moment. But we were trying to understand, do we see consistency in the same technology platform because one of the things we always worry about is the way in which the tool that we use can affect what we do so let's say we all use reddit do all the communities end up the same on different subreddits or do they actually vary or is it a small variation or is it a huge variation well let's find out because that will help us design technology now what we actually did when we looked at reddit we quickly found there were some things we could readily identify computers so we could actually gather data automatically. We could extract it. And one thing was links. We could see people posting hyperlinks to web pages, et cetera. That would give some informational evidence to support their point of view. Uh, we also found people would use images. Uh, there weren't as many of them, as we'll see in, in a moment, but they would actually be there to try and convey some information or evidence. Look, see this. Boris Johnson is a space alien. Um, or we could see quotations where people would actually quote from a source that block quotes in Reddit are used when you respond to another post, but you also can use them to provide material from other sources. So all of these were actually quite common in the three different Reddits. So we could check that we're going to find them, we could extract them, and we could then look at them systematically at scale. So a mixture of qualitative assessment and quantitative assessment as afterwards. So well, quant, qual, quant, because yeah. we counted them first, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and we looked at three different communities, uh, one which was about conspiracies. Uh, Reddit, r slash conspiracy. One called Change My View, which was about People come on going, please tell me how to change my mind, going back to Dana's example. And the third one was debunk this, where you come up with something go, I'm not sure this is true, but it might be true. Can someone you know, debunk it or, or maybe tell me it's true? So three sort of topically related discussion-based formats, <clears throat> but with quite different audiences, we would guess, um, but also all who can and all similarly previously studied. So we had some idea about these communities from prior research. 
No, I, I'll give you a few graphs because we do like a bit of clock occasion here. Yeah. Um, the number of posts was not quite the similar. As you can see here, there's a small number of posts in debunk. This is, as we said, those posts were generally richer and more complex because you were being explicitly asked for evidence. Uh, and the original post had to actually say, oh, here's the evidence I want you to debunk. Uh, conspiracy, on the other hand, had lots of posts. And uh, you can see here immediately block quotes, very, very common and change my view. So uh, very different patterns. Uh, and if you get mispresented, by the way, those, those, those differences become much more marked in how frequently there's evidence used in general and how those different types are used. Now, so yep. so they've gone to some other website, they've got a paragraph set in the view. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And there's a, and it's sort of a tag that called block quote so you can automatically extract it if you download the data from reddit which you can no longer do thanks generative ai um you can kind of run a script over it and just count and scrape and the, that can be quotes of other people in the thread it can be quotes from books rather than that in fact this is something we saw quite a bit people go in fact you could get links and block quotes together here's a block quote and by the way here's thanks to the whole thing if you want it so some posts actually compounded the different approaches. Um, and if we just took images as an example, there's some things where we could look at the, just the content of what these things are. So screen grabs, or conspiracy, loves a screen grab. Oh, I'm changed my view. Come to believe. Um, you see the numbers in these aren't particularly big, so I wouldn't want to draw too many things. See, conspiracy has a lot of images in general, and there's very little from change my view. And see, bunk dislikes diagrams, medical images. That um, was all from one thread, though, which was a conspiracy theorist thread. <laughs> it was like these images prove that JFK was shot by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, all all these things have to be interpreted a little bit with, with some degree of caution. But if we look at the block quoted material that you asked about previous posts, very very much common on our conspiracy. There was a lot of Yes, I agree. You said this. Now, here's more I have to say about it. Might be agreeing, might be disagreeing, but there was a lot of internal references. Change my view as well. People would keep the discussion going. But then if we look at debunk this, it's like, hello, where did it disappear to? Um, but academic sources are very common on debunk this. Uh, and, you know, there's a smattering of other stuff, but there's actually a relatively sparse amount. Like, this isn't from the whole data set. We actually, to, to do this level of analysis, we took 60 uh, cases of each of these types and we manually went in and did them and then did, as Dana said, numbers. So there's an exchange all the time between qualitative discovery and then quantifying and then going back to understand it better. Now, there are some things we got out of this as a result, uh, one of which was that uh, there's a fair amount of tool bias. It's certain things people will do because it's deep, like you know, quoting the previous post, right? Uh, that, that's called tool bias. To everybody with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, but also, we have to remember a lot of this data is working from these sites, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Reddit, what I was. So this is strongly driven by tools that are developed around the attention economy. And that's one of the things that may be distorting what's going on here. Um, you know, we might ideally suggest things should be nice and balanced and should be different points of view because that would allow some of it. But actually, more often, it's like the leaning tower of Pisa. Things are very much skewed in one direction or other. Now, as information technologists, that's one where we have some concerns. Dana pointed out earlier you know, the importance of having suppressive interactions that are simple, like upvotes or downvotes. They can be very easy for people to use, but there are limitations to that. And one of the problems that underneath this that we can observe is that we can see also some of the stuff is basically being generated by bot-like behaviors. Um, we also need to structure interactions. And one of the things that's uh, somewhat of a chaos here is that when we start looking at the evidence, for instance, even sites that call for a lot of evidence, it's not as common as you'd like to think. Um, but there's some lessons we can draw from other parts of information and interaction where we know that very quick interactions tend to result in affirming biases of one form or other. 
the hit thing where you hit the confirm button and you went, no, that's not what I meant to do. Because we're used to having interaction paces being quite quick. Thomas Green years ago said, actually, there are times in interaction you want to slow it down because it improves accuracy and reflection. And maybe that's something where we need to really think about how we set these interfaces up to you know, sort of have those moments for the sort of engagement you know, I was talking about. Um, thank you very much. So we don't have much time for questions, but we've asked if it went to maybe one or two, and then we'll have to go. Um, yep. I think we're joining you. So, yeah. so any questions? Last question would be, yeah. Hi, I would like to know a little bit more about the second study where you were showing the uh, change view. So you had like several interviews on Skype. Uh, some were in person, only two were on Skype. Ah, okay, so I'm just on Skype. Um, my question would be like, could you give us like an approximate how many people you interviewed? How was that a little bit like in, in age distribution or things like that that I could have like that you could have also a little bit of context of who was so self-identified gender again, um, predominantly women. Uh, so I think out of our our eighteen eleven women and seven men um everyone was situated in the uk most in london um about half were either at or had recently been at a university but not all of them were um some i think at least two had never attended a university and age range was sort of early 20s to early 40s. We didn't ask exactly. This is me kind of making a guess basic, based on the people I met because um, yeah, you ask people for the information you need to do the analysis. And uh, yeah. asking people to give us an exact age felt a bit not right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, you, you has another question I would like to know. Also, like you go, I want to have like a little bit more of an, an idea how this kind of analysis goes on because I, I don't, I, I'm not so qualitative. Um, so I would like to know like if you go into this, into this analysis, you just go and say, ask people directly, do you, how do you, how do you feel about uh, information that you don't agree or is that like going into general questions and then you, at some point? You ask them general questions because otherwise you bias the answers. So with the view change stuff, the first thing we did was tell us a little bit about the view change you want to talk about today. So how did it start? Where, when did you first start thinking maybe the view I held on this isn't right? Was there any information involved in that? That's the type of thing you do because you don't want to push them towards a specific type of narrative or answer. Um, and again, with these ones, this was a particularly sensitive set of interviews because it would have been really easy to shame people and we needed to not do that. You need to elicit, not interrogate. 